uh, type 2 diabetes, hyperlipidemia, and increased uh, blood clots, which is thrombosis. So for all of these reasons, the current thinking is obesity is a disease, a chronic relapsing condition caused by energy dysregulation, as well as uh, causing impairment in multiple organ systems. Now, what you're seeing now are highlights from a second interactive animation piece available to you uh, that you are, have available uh, to download and look at yourself. And another way of looking at what the other issues are all about. And I'm going to try to move on to the next piece. Uh, if I can get back to where I was, thank, thank you very much. Now I wanna now shift our discussion to patient-centered screening, uh, diagnosis and counseling, and what you could do in clinical practice to improve care. This will address our second learning objective which is to summarize guidelines for screening, diagnosis, and patient counseling for obesity and obesity-related disorders. Fatim, I'm gonna hand it over to you for this section. Thanks so much, Bob. It's a delight to be here to discuss um, our second objective. Um, and I really want us to start by looking at how we define obesity, which is by using BMI criteria. And what you can see on this particular slide is how we look at BMI criteria in the current guidelines that we utilize. So a person is considered to have underweight if their BMI is below 18 and a half. A person is considered to have normal weight status if their BMI is between 18 and a half and 24.9. A person has pre-obesity or overweight when their BMI is between 25 and 29.9. And then we get into our three classes of obesity, class one, class two, and class three, what we consider to be mild, moderate, and severe obesity, mild being characterized by BMI of 30 to 34.9, moderate a BMI of 35 to 39.9, and then those that have severe obesity, a BMI of greater than or equal to 40. But what I do want to pay attention to is how the BMI chart has not been reflective of racial and ethnic minority populations. What we do know is that the BMI chart that we currently use is based upon the Metropolitan Life Insurance Tables from the 1930s. In those calculations, persons that look like myself, racial and ethnic minorities, were not included in those actuarial tables, which are the basis for what we utilize for BMI. As such, I went back to redraw the tables in 2019 and published this study in the Mayo Clinic Proceedings, where we use the current NHANES, and the NHANES, of course, is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey data to discern what the BMI cutoff should be based upon obesity-related diseases, particularly hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, and then greater than two of those risk factors. What I want you to pay attention to on the left side of the slide is that if we're looking at men almost universally, regardless of racial ethnic group here in the United States, the BMI curve actually shifts below 30, with an exception for white men um, with diabetes. You can see the cutoff would be 30, but notice how it shifts below that cutoff for 30 when looking at this in real time. Um, I want to also pay attention to the right side of the screen, and I want to particularly hone in on focusing on Black women, because what we see here is that the BMI curve actually shifts up when we're looking at Black women with hypertension, diabetes, or greater than two risk factors. So we need to be thoughtful and mindful about how BMI does give us height and weight and calculates a number, but does not give us the end-all be-all for how we should approach thinking about patients with overweight and obesity. What we do know about obesity is that it is a multifactorial disorder where genetics, environment, development, and behavior all play a role in a person's likelihood of having this disease. But what I really want to show you is this next slide. And in this next slide, I love this. And for um, the three of us that are presenting today, we're all very active in a group called the Obesity Society. And this comes out of the Obesity Society in 2015 and really shows you all of the potential um, factors that may play a role in someone having the disease of obesity. What I want you to pay attention to is on the left side in that gray color, we see those factors that are inside of an individual that might lead to obesity. On the right side, things that are outside of the individual that might lead to obesity. And that top thing, you see things that increase your intake. 
in the bottom, those things that decrease how much you're able to burn. And in the middle, we see things that affect either intake or expenditure or very, very small print. It says unknown. We recognize that there are things that we don't yet know about this disease, and we're continuing to learn every day. Now, I want to take out a few of these factors. I want to go to the next slide and look at all of those contributors or influencers to obesity. These are the big categories by which um, we can begin to group things. So biological or medical reasons why someone may struggle with weight, food and beverage, behavior and environment, maternal and developmental, social, psychological, economic, and then environmental pressures and physical activity. These are the big groupings that we want to pay attention to. And in our next slide, we're going to bring out just a few of those that we saw in that much larger, really complex, you know, um, graph that we saw earlier. So let's look at those um, potential contributors to obesity inside of the person. A few representative examples. Things that might increase one's intake are hyperreactivity to environmental food cues. Maybe you walk past a pizza place and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm, I really would like that pizza. Another person doesn't even notice the pizza place is there. Things like delayed satiety and disordered eating. Now, things that may decrease expenditure are things like the gut microbiota. What we do know is that the gut microbiota and in individuals that are lean versus those that have obesity differ drastically. Thermogenesis, how much someone's able to burn, I'd rest in with activity, a lot of that's genetically determined. And then of course, physical disabilities. If you have a disability, not able to burn as much as someone who is able-bodied. When we look at the things that might increase intake and decrease expenditure, we have to pay attention to genetic and epigenetic factors. These are very important. And it's important for us to recognize the heritability of obesity and recognize that weight is indeed more inheritable than height itself. Age-related changes are extremely important. And these are particularly important in women's lives because there are three key points in a woman's life where we see major weight shifts um, at the onset of menses, um, if the person decides to get pregnant, and at menopause. And then, of course, mood disturbances, things like depression and anxiety. There are contributors to obesity that are outside of an individual that we pay attention to. And you can see that this is a lot going on here. Things that may increase intake are environmental or chemical toxins, pervasive food advertising, or large portion sizes, for example. Things that may decrease expenditure are things like the built environment. How, what type of environment are you in that allows physical activity? Sedentary time and labor saving devices like our lovely washing, washing machines and dryers and dishwashers, for example. Things that increase intake and decrease expenditure are things like stress. Stress leads to increase in inflammation, storage of adipose tissue, um, weight cycling. That means you start in this diet, you get off, you start again, you start, start a new diet, um, and that's problematic. And then maternal and paternal obesity, things that um, we want to pay attention to. Now, what I want to take you through are some of the key um, steps that we will utilize when we're looking at the guidelines from the American Heart Association, the American College of Cardiology, and the Obesity Society. First, we'll start with the patient encounter. And in that patient encounter, we'll measure height, weight, and calculate BMI, thinking about um, what we talked about earlier with regards to BMI. We'll determine one's weight category because that weight category will have implications for our treatment modalities. We'll assess and treat cardiovascular disease risk factors and obesity-related conditions, and we will assess weight and lifestyle histories. You know, Fatima, before we do that, uh, let's ask our audience another question. Uh, so you could all vote uh, now. Here's the question. What minimum amount of weight loss can lead to therapeutic benefits in cardiovascular disease risk factors, such as diabetes, hypertension, or dyslipidemia? Is it 1%, 3%, 5%, 10%, or you're not sure? Fatima, let's see how they do. Excellent. All right, so I think we can see here that 56% of individuals said that about 3%, so two, and that is the correct answer, the minimum amount of weight loss that leads to benefits for cardiovascular disease. So you guys are doing really well. It means like I don't have to do much of my job, but let's continue with my work here. 
Now, when we're looking at weight loss in terms of diabetes prevention, hypertension, dyslipidemia, I do want to bring attention to this um, particular um, information that we have here out of the diabetes care in 2015. What we can see is for diabetes prevention, as low as 3% weight loss can lead to significant shifts. You can see that ranges from three to 10%. With regards to remission of diabetes, of course, once we have the disease, remission of the disease greater than 15%, so a much larger percentage of weight loss needed. Um, hypertension, three to 15%, and dyslipidemia, three to greater than 15%. So it's important for us to assess and treat cardiovascular um, disease risk factors along with obesity related comorbidities. We'll start using our history and physical exam. So nothing really fancy, just doing a really thorough physical exam and getting great history from our patients. We wanna look at clinical and laboratory measurements. Things that are extremely important are things like the blood pressure, the fasting blood glucose, a fasting lipid panel that's based on expert opinion when these um, guidelines were developed and looking at waist circumference. Now in waist circumference, our typical target, particularly if we're looking at non-Hispanic white women would be less than 35 inches um, waist circumference um, for women and less than 40 inches. Um, this is measured at the widest portion at the umbilicus. With regards to intensive management of cardiovascular disease risk factors, these are just a few, a very, very small list of the several different diseases that are associated or caused by the disease of obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, prediabetes and diabetes, and then finally obstructive sleep apnea. We do wanna assess weight and lifestyle histories. I talked about this when we were kind of looking at the different steps. So we wanna ask our patients about the history of weight gain and loss over time. That can give us a lot of information about this patient and their lifetime um, often of struggles with their weight. We wanna have details of previous weight loss attempts. We wanna capture dietary habits and physical activity. These are important. We talked about the heritability of obesity a bit earlier. So we wanna ask about the family history of obesity. And we wanna look at other medical conditions or medications as Dr. Kushner mentioned earlier that may affect weight. And then as we continue with our guidelines and following the guidelines, we wanna assess the need to lose weight. Um, we wanna advise to avoid weight gain and address other risk factors, but it's important for us to know how ready the patient is to make change. If the patient is not in the area of ready to make change, maybe their pre-contemplation, then maybe this conversation is something that we should have at a different time when they're ready to begin to address this. We wanna identify barriers to excess. There, there are different reasons why patients may struggle, even with the guidance of persons like you see here on this panel that dedicate our lives to the treatment of patients with obesity. We wanna determine weight loss and health goals and health strategies, intervention strategies that we might utilize. And we do wanna think about comprehensive lifestyle therapies alone first or in conjunction with adjunctive therapies like pharmacotherapy or metabolic and bariatric surgery. Now I will be remiss if I did a presentation and did not bring up this idea of weight stigma and how we as healthcare providers are often some of the worst perpetrators of weight stigma. And so I'm gonna talk about how we can impact our patients. So when a patient experiences weight stigma, that leads to stress. That stress in turn leads to changes in eating and physical activity behaviors where we see things like binge eating, um, increased caloric consumption, maladaptive weight control, a lower motivation for exercise, and with that, of course, less physical activity. But that stress actually leads to physiologic reactivity where we actually see increased levels of cortisol, CRP, hemoglobin A1C, and elevated blood pressure. So this stigma that they experience leads to that physiologic expression. What does that mean for them in terms of healthcare services? If we can go back um, to the previous slide, um, there's poor treatment adherence, less trust of health providers, avoidance of follow-up care, delay in preventive health screenings, and poor communication. All of those issues then lead to weight gain, which causes psychological health and distress. So we'll see things like depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, poor body image, substance abuse, and unfortunately, even suicidality. 
That then leads to physiologic health and distress where we see poor glycemic control, less effective chronic disease self-management, more advanced and poorly controlled chronic disease, and finally, a lower health-related quality of life. So I want you to be mindful about how you yourself or your office setting may be contributing to stigma that can then affect the overall health of our patients. So when we look at how we engage in weight management counseling, I like to look at the six A's. And I think these six A's are really quite great in terms of thinking of us engaging. First, we wanna ask, we wanna ask for permission to begin to engage with patients about a discussion with their weight. We wanna use preferred terms. So you've noticed that during this presentation, we have used um, terms like with obesity, we don't call patients obese, that labeling is stigmatizing. We don't call them fat. We don't say morbid obesity. These, like, this language has been changed at the AMA level, even at 2017. We wanna listen and avoid paternalism. That's important and our personal biases that can contribute to worse outcomes with our patients. After asking, we wanna then assess the patient. We wanna look at the pre-encounter, um, look at weight-related um, issues that we've talked about. Determine what the patient's expectations are. And we wanna make sure that our exam is centered on a patient that has obesity, exploring all of the things, looking for things like acanthosis, nigricans, which can be prominent in those that have obesity, um, hyperinsulinism, for example. Then we want to go to advising. We wanna have, look at the positive aspects of providing care. Um, and we wanna use the US um, PSTF guidelines. Notice we talked about BMI cutoff and we wanna pay attention to how this may differ by um, race and ethnicity. We wanna look at the challenges of managing weight, recognizing this is a chronic disease that requires chronic therapy. Um, and we wanna respect the patient if they're not interested. So if they're in that pre-contemplative state, we don't wanna push them. We wanna embrace this when they're ready to make a change with our interaction and help. Then we're going to agree. We're gonna trust um, the model. Um, we're gonna to respond to patient cues. The patients are giving us the answers. So I always tell my patients, they are the answer to the question. We wanna consider issues like culture, religion. These are extremely important. Um, and we wanna look at some SMART goals and think about treatment choices and efficacy. Then we'll go on to number five, which is to assist the patient. Um, look at options that are both written and electronically that we can give to our patients to help them. We wanna leverage the entire team, um, the entire team in a multidisciplinary care of obese, um, obesity is extremely important. And so we wanna pay attention to all the um, important players. And then finally, we want to arrange, arrange for follow-up visits, appropriate referrals, um, regional resources that the patients may need. We wanna coordinate that care and be at the helm of that. Now, I wanted to make sure that you guys are aware, and this is something that you guys can get access to. This is a free resource that's developed by all of these wonderful groups that you see on the right side of your screen. Um, it's called the Weight Can't Wait Guide. Um, and it really helps you begin to have that initial conversations with patients. And so I think this is a wonderful, important tool and resource. So I would, I would take a look at this when you have a chance. It's a, available for download in the healthcare um, provider resources tab of this activity. Um, and then when we look at the treatment guidelines based upon the BMI criteria, it's important to recognize that we can use lifestyle modifications, which include diet, exercise, and behavior changes across the entire BMI spectrum. I want you to see here on this slide that for Asian Americans, the cutoff is even lower. Um, you can see that the cutoff for really considering that is at the BMI of 23 and higher. So I want to pay, make sure that we are aware of that. With regards to pharmacotherapy, we typically begin to um, utilize pharmacotherapy um, in persons that have maximized lifestyle, um, have a BMI of 27 with an obesity-related disease, like hypertension, sleep apnea, for example. Um, and also for those persons that have a BMI of greater than or equal to 30, which means they have obesity um, without any um, obesity-associated disease. And if a medication is deemed effective, meaning they've lost about 5% of their total body weight loss at three months of use of the medication, we do recommend continuing the medication indefinitely. Yes, indefinitely. If we pull back the medications that are acting on obviously different portions of the brain to control weight, then we will see weight regain. 
Well, thanks, Fatima. That was a great uh, overview uh, of, of something that we do every day in our practice. Um, I'd encourage all of you to uh, read the guidelines uh, and go to the literature to supplement what Fatima went over with you. But that was really a really great, uh, great introduction or, or reminder of those of you, uh, for those of you already doing obesity care. Fatima, now that you have teased the section on treatment by addressing BMI cut points for initiating therapy, I want to turn to Ken Fujioka, who will address our third learning objective, which is assess efficacy and safety of available and emerging therapies for long-term treatment for obesity. Ken, go ahead, take it away. Thanks, Bob. Appreciate it. Okay, we got a, a lot to cover, and uh, I hope you don't feel like you're back in med school, pharmacology, but it is a little complex. Hang in there. I think you're going to get some really useful information because you're kind of looking at the future. Uh, I mean, I wish I was a young doc because these newer meds that are coming out for weight loss are, are really physiologic and are going to work much better than anything we've had before. So, you know, these are the order of drugs that have been improved recently. You got semaglutide, which is very recent, as you know, just literally a week ago or two weeks ago, you got setmelanotide, which is a whole nother, it's kind of part of that designer group of meds that you're going to be seeing. So as you know, genetics and um, Fatima really explained well about how uh, the genetics can really play a big part of weight gain. And so as Bob talked about, all these hormones are coming up telling you to stop eating GLP-1, PYY, amylin. But what if the receptor where they go to is broken so that they don't get the message? In other words, the food goes up. I mean, excuse me, the hormones go up to tell them they're full, but they don't stop eating because that receptor is genetically amino acid substitution. It kind of changes shape and doesn't work anymore. That's what this drug is for. So again, brand new group. And I'll show you how to use it because it's a little bit tricky because you need to find people with that genetic defect. You got Gelsis 100. Again, futuristic, brand new. And it's not really a pharmacologic agent. It's truly a device, but you're going to use it like any other drug. You're going to give it with lunch and dinner and it's going to expand and, and make them feel full. Kind of fascinating. But, but again, there's a line of drugs all coming, or excuse me, line of devices all coming along this line. Liraglutide. Okay, this is the first of the, what I call the physiologic treatments, a GLP-1 hormone. When you eat a meal, your small intestines will taste the food and say, oh my God, there's some food. I better send up some GLP-1 to the brain and tell myself to stop eating and it's okay to lose weight. Yeah, this was the first of that group. And as you know, GLP-1s have been around forever for type 2 diabetes. Then we switch gears again, two very old drugs, naltrexone and bupropion. So not every drug works on everybody. Why? Because everybody has different reasons why they gain weight. But one of the more common, if you were to pool a hundred patients that came into your office struggling with weight and you asked them about cravings, do you crave a specific food? Cravings doesn't really have anything to do with hunger. It's uh, uh, and again, as Dr. Stanford said, say you're stressed. And so when you're stressed, you got to have some chips or you got to have a, a chocolate bar or something like that. That's reward eating and it's dopamine, norepinephrine kind of thing. And guess what? Bupropion works on dopamine, norepinephrine, so lowers that, but also it's an opiate driven behavior. So again, naltrexone. So this is a particularly good drug for cravings, but there are also some effects directly on the hypothalamus as well. Then you have, again, some older drugs, fentramine and topiramate. Now, quite honestly, nobody knows how topiramate works. I've never seen a good study to show it. We're guessing it's through the GABA system, which works again up in the hypothalamus to give a feeling of satiety, a very powerful one, actually. Um, and then phenamine, which is a stimulant. So stimulant is working along that norepinephrine dopamine avenue. Um, and then you got Orlistat, again, old medication over the counter now, just blocks the uptake of fat or it's a lipase inhibitor. And then last off, phenamine by itself, which again has been around since the 50s, very old agent approved for short-term use, you know, 12 weeks in a 12 month period. So you're saying, well, Ken, show me the money. How much weight loss am I going to get? So this graph really says it all. So you look at that blue bar with some magnetite, and you're going, oh my gosh, 15% weight loss. And again, earlier, um, 
Dr. Stanford said, hey, look, all you got to do is get 5%. You're, you're improving all kinds of things. This is great. But now we're talking 15. This makes patients so happy because they don't want 5%. I mean, if they're 200 pounds, they don't want to see 10 pounds. They want 20, 30, 40 pounds. Guess what? Now these newer drugs are going to be doing that. It's not to say the other drugs don't work. They're good. And so you got phenamine to close to 10. You got uh, bupropion and the on that green bar. It's about eight. And again, It'll work really well in some patients and maybe not so well in others, depending on the why they are gaining weight. And then you got uh, liraglutide, again, close to 8%. And then you got Orlistat, which is right around six. Next slide, thank you. And so I'm gonna spend more time on this newer class, just so you understand one, how we study these, which is just intense. You do multiple studies, but two, just so you can get a feel for, well, gee, my diabetic patient didn't lose as much weight or something like that. So you understand what's going on here. So step one is just a standard obesity trial, the standard run of the mill patient that comes in to see you and needs to lose weight. And they get some diet, some exercise, not intense, but you know, the standard, what we can do pretty easily as primary care docs. And you follow them for a year. Step two, now this is the tough group. Type two diabetics have a very tough time losing weight whether it's their genetics, their, their drugs are on, say sulfonylurea or insulin or whatever, they just don't lose as much. And so expect to see lower numbers. Then you'd step three is what I call the Wadden special. Tom Wadden has developed some of the best behavioral interventions for how to lose weight from just changing your behavior. So they did intensive behavior modification on this group plus a weight loss medication. So again, you'd expect to see some of the better weight loss in this group. And then the last group, which I'll spend the most time on, maintenance. This really just hammer homes the point that Dr. Kushner made in that biggest loser he talked about. Six years, they followed him. They were still, their body was still trying to regain the weight six years out. And in this study, that's really what they're doing. They're going to put the patients on both the, what, one group on, on the drug and another group on the drug for 20 weeks. So they're both getting it for 20 weeks, but after 20 weeks, then they split off. One gets a placebo, oh, I'd hate to be in that group. And then the other group gets the drug and stays on it out to a year. And so what happens is you're gonna see, hopefully, you know, one group do better than the other, or heck, maybe you just need it for 20 weeks. We'll find out. Next slide. Ken, before you go, let, I'm going to throw in another audience response You're question roll, here. Oh, Bob. Okay. Yeah, I know. I'm going to have you hold, hold it there. Uh, and then <laughs> I'm going to have you respond to it. So here's our last question. You can vote now. In the step three trials, what proportion of participants attended, excuse me, attained at least a 5% weight loss in the semaglutide 2.4 milligram arm versus placebo? Was it more than 50%, more, more than 65%? nearly 70%, more than 80%, or you're not sure? What do you guys think? Go ahead and vote. I'm not sure. I think there's two answers there, but that's a tough one. Okay, not too bad. I I'll tell you, the answer is all over the place. Don't worry if you didn't get this one right. And I'll show you in the next slide why that is. So if you look at this, if you look, particularly if you look at the diabetics, which is, again, this is really good for diabetics, but, you know, losing at 5%, that third uh, row down, 68.8% lost at least 5%. So again, and, and again, as Dr. Stanford said, you lose 5%, you're moving in the right direction in a really nice way. You're getting cardiovascular benefits. You're improving all kinds of really nice things, but all the other groups, they're like over 85%. We've not seen this before. In the past, we were happy just to get half the patients to lose at least 5%. So again, this is a whole other ballpark. Let's move. Uh, so step one, on average, it lost about 15% or 14.9. Again, and, then, and you saw in the other studies, this is a, another ball game. The diabetics just under 10%, 9.6, which again, most of the time in these studies, they lose less than five. Now with more intensive behavior modification, now you're getting over 15%, 16%. And actually in that study, well over a third of the patients were losing over 20%. That's what you lose with bariatric surgery. So again, whole nother ball game. Now step four was the one that really just blew my mind. And, and again, it's hard to look at these numbers, 
Remembering both groups, the placebo group and the semaglutide group were on drug for 20 weeks. After 20 weeks, you can see the semaglutide group who had already lost um, close to 10% of their weight lose another 8%. So they're losing, you know, 17.4% at the end of that trial, really good. But the placebo group, you can see after they stop the drug, they're, they're, they're injecting every day. They're still doing diet. They're still doing exercise. They gain 7%. Oh, bummers. But it tells you again, what Bob was teaching, this metabolic adaptation thing is very real and hangs in there for a very long time. This is just the kind of give you an idea of the, of the weight loss. And again, I'm dating myself, but back when I was studying these things in the early nineties, you know, we would see most of the weight loss in the first two months, three months, not so anymore. And again, you're not really giving a drug, you're giving a hormone. You see the slow, steady weight loss out to 63 weeks. I mean, that's impressive. And so the top group is, you know, all comers and what we call intention to treat. Uh, in other words, if they came in once, you just carry their weight out to the end, or if they came in through the whole time, you use their weight. But the bottom group, this is a group, hopefully that we see the group that comes in, they follow up, they take their meds. Well, I guess not all patients do that, but we like them to, but notice that weight loss is actually still going down at 63 weeks. It's just real steady. And again, they're getting weight loss. Well, you know, well above 15%. Yeah. You're getting, and, and this, you know, any new future weight loss med is going to have to be in this this realm. And, and again, they are, which is really cool. Next slide. So how about the problems? You know, not every drug's perfect. And, and I'm going to try and do some teaching on just GLP ones in general. So how do they work? We talked about it. You know, you you eat a meal, you send a GLP one up to the brain to tell you, stop eating, tell the brain, yeah, it's okay to lose weight. But it also, there are GLP receptors in the GI tract and it slows down gastric emptying. And when you slow down gastric emptying, it doesn't feel really good. And it can feel like nausea to a lot of your patients. So you can see in the very top one, 44% of the patients had nausea. And this all happens in the beginning when you first start it, when you first start ramping up the dose, which takes months. So hang in there. And this is where you as the prescriber got to do your job and just slow down the titration. Just don't go up real fast. If they have nausea, don't keep driving up the dose because they're, they're going to get more nauseated. They're going to get diarrhea. They're going to get vomiting. So again, just don't go up faster. But the top three, diarrhea, vomiting, a little bit of constipation. Constipation is tough because we see that in general with just weight loss. And you're going, wow, the top four, you have both diarrhea and constipation. And again, everybody's different. Next slide. So these are... This is just a teaching slide, just so you know, well, then how do you tell if your drug's working and should you even continue to use it? Is there something I can, you know, something I can look for? Is there something that tells me this drug is better for that patient? So, so far, we really struggle with finding the right drug for the right patient. So one of the best ways is just give the drug and see what happens. So with Gelesis, you can see that at eight weeks, if they had at least 3% weight loss, they went on to lose at least 5%. As a matter of fact, they lost almost 10%. If you look at phenamine topiramate, same thing. Within 12 weeks, if they lose 3% or more, they go on to lose more than 5%. And again, they lose over 10% if they're in that group. Bupropion naltrexone, it's a little bit longer. So you got to go out four months or 16 weeks, and they have to lose at least 5% or more. And that group will go on and lose more or over 5%. And again, about 10%. And then last time, loraglutide, again, very close. Um, 4% or more weight loss is 16 weeks. They're going to go on to lose more than 5% or 5% or more or around 10%. Next slide. So, and you know, the person doing the slides probably saying, Ken, quit saying next slide. I know what I'm doing. So I'm sorry. It's just, it's in me. All right. So when you're looking at the weight loss and I'm just trying to point this point out, if let's say they don't lose 4% at 16 weeks, then you see those top two lines, 3% or 3.1, that's how much weight they lose. They don't lose much weight. But again, if they lose 4% or more of their weight at 16 weeks, look at that weight loss. It goes all the way out. They're losing 8.5. That's your diabetics. Or again, in your uh, non-diabetics, it's over 10% weight loss. So again, that first three to four months are really crucial and will really teach you a lot about you know, whether they respond to that med. If they don't, you may have to use a different one. 
another, another teaching slide. If you do use uh, phenamine topiramate, which um, it's a tricky drug to use, and I'll go over some of the, the pearls on how do you use it, because there are some uh, things you need to be careful of. But what I'm trying to teach here is when you look at 108 weeks, so in other words, at the end of the study, two years plus, that the, the mid-dose, the 7.5 of phenamine with 46 topiramate, you get 9.3% weight loss. But if you look at the one below that, the bigger dose, 15 of phenamine with 92 of topiramate, you get 10.5. So in other words, you get about 1% more of weight loss. But what this slide doesn't tell you is when you go up in dose, you get more side effects. And again, this medication tends to be a little tricky to use because when you have two drugs, you get twice as many side effects. So you have a stimulant on one side, you got topiramate, which has its own set of side effects. So again, personally, I like to use that mid dose and stick with that. In the long run, I'm knowing I'm getting pretty good weight loss. Uh, oh, so this is again, you guys are just stepping into these new, neat, new just devices now. So what are non-systemic super absorbent hydrogel? So these are little particles. They basically take cellulose. I mean, we're, we're talking, it, it, it's called by the FDA grass. No, no, not marijuana, generally regarded as safe. And um, so it's, it's in that category. And also it's not absorbed. And you cross-link it with citric acid, vitamin C. And when you do that, when you add water to it, you can get it to expand. So it's basically like all of a sudden making a filler really quick. The trick is the patient has to drink 16 ounces of water with it. So they do this with lunch and with dinner. And then this thing expands, 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 that's a new word, expands, and then goes through the small intestines and giving a feeling of fullness. So again, and you're gonna see more of these coming out. They're, they're very, the, 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 what I call the food technology is ramping up again at this incredible rate. Next slide. So the weight loss is pedestrian, but you can really improve it, but again, by using the responders. So if you, if you got your responders, they lose, you know, 3% or more with just within two months, you know, they're going to go on to lose 10%. But the placebo group, as you can see there, lost about 4.39%. They actually lost kind of a lot. And whenever you drink water before a meal, if you can drink 16 ounces of water, yeah, you lose a little bit of weight. Um, so the drug group, or excuse me, the device group loses 6.41%. So, okay, good. They lose more statistically significant. And again, if you follow the responder analysis rules, they'll get much better weight loss. All right, the designer drug. So we're going to be talking about setmelanotide, which, which is, so believe it or not, if you were to check the genetics of all your patients that came in with morbid obesity, about one in 20. So you might see one of these patients once a week. If you, they'll have what's called a single gene mutation. So in other words, one of the genes that controls food intake is broken. And in this particular site, when we look at what we're looking for is an MC4 receptor defect. And so these folks, and we talked a little bit about earlier, when you eat a meal, you send up hormones to the brain to tell you to stop eating but these poor folks have a broken receptor. So they just don't get it. it. It's really interesting to watch them eat because they're sitting there eating and they're actually looking around the room. Oh, he stopped. Oh, she stopped. Maybe I should stop eating now because they're, again, they don't get the signal. The only time they know to stop eating is when it actually gets uncomfortable. And then they've eaten too many calories at that point. So they never get satiated, which, which is really tough. And I'm always impressed with these patients who keep their weight down because they really work at it. The way you confirm that they have this, one of these genetic defects, and there's several of them, they just do a simple oral swab test, just, you know, put in a swab, send it off and they can find it out. And again, they're running these things for free because they're, everyone's trying to find these patients right now. So the reason why we didn't include their weight loss with the other graph that we showed earlier is just because they did a very unusual study and they combined all the different studies in one, because again, this is a very rare genetic disease, but again, it's probably more common than we think. We just don't look for it. So that I, I think it's orange or red uh, dot is the mean, but they show actually all the patients in study, which isn't a huge number of patients. They did do other trials though. So they had enough patients to get it approved, but you can see that in that first 12 weeks, everybody, you know, gets the med 
uh, except for the placebo group, which is up there a little bit. No, excuse me. Everybody gets a drug because again, it's an, this is an ultra orphan drug. So you don't have to have